Well, y'all going to be all right with the message. Amen. We are, as Dr. Gilbert said, we are commemorating the life of Dr. Martin Luther King, who at the age of just 39 was murdered. And I say the term murdered because folks try to make it sound pretty. He was murdered. His life was taken away from Coretta. It was taken away from their four children. It was taken away from the movement. It was taken away from the people that he was trying to lift up. He was murdered. Murdered, shot, dead, killed. Murdered. And today, this week, we've been pausing to remember what God did in him so he could work through him. Let me say it again. We've been celebrating what God did in him so he could work through him. And today you will hear that God, who did that in Martin and worked through Martin, wants to do the same thing in you and work through you. Amen. Turn to your neighbor. Say, neighbor, the same God that worked in him wants to work in me and wants to work through me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, sometimes we, 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 we forget that, right? We, we, we put our heroes on these pedestals and, and we think the lives that they live are unreachable. But when you look at it, what made Martin who he was, was the king of kings and the lord of the lords and the lily of the valley and the bright and the morning star. What made him who he was, was that he had Jesus on the inside. We're going to talk today about when the church is silent. Dr. King was not shy about critiquing the church. As, as a matter of fact, April 16th, 1963, he wrote from a Birmingham jail a letter to church folks. Church folks who, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5, but, but it's just so you can turn there. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 5. It's going to be our text that we pull from today. But in 1963, April 16, 1963, Dr. King writes a letter from a Birmingham jail. And he writes to church folks. Just like the book of Ephesians, these, these church folks, see the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians are all about theology. It's all about what you believe, right? And then the next three chapters are all about how you behave. Hello, restoration. Amen. It, it, it's all about how you believe in, in the first three, and it's all about how you behave in the next three chapters. So Dr. King was writing a letter from a Birmingham jail to other church folks who were professing that they believed something, but they were behaving another way. Amen. Turn your neighbor, say, neighbor, talk is cheap. And when we deal with the civil rights movement, when we deal with social justice issues, when it comes to the church, talk is cheap. See, you can recite everything, all of the theology of the first three chapters of Ephesians, but if you get over to the last three chapters and you can't behave in alignment with your theology, then that's going to cause some problems. See, we have a lot of folks who know the theology in the first three chapters of Ephesians, but they remain behaving badly in our world today. Amen. Dr. King wrote this letter to, the, to these church folks from a Birmingham jail, and I want to read a couple excerpts, and then we'll move, we'll move quickly. He, he says that, I have heard numerous Southern religious leaders admonish their, worship, their worshipers to comply with the desegregation decision because it's the law. But I have longed to hear white ministers declare, follow this decree because integration is morally right and because the Negro is your brother. In the midst of blatant injustices inflicted upon the Negro, I have watched churchmen stand on the sidelines and mouth pious irrelevancies and sanctimonious trivialities. In the midst of a mighty struggle to rid our nation of racial and economic injustices, the church has become silent. 
He says, I've watched many churches commit themselves to a completely otherworldly religion that makes strange, unbiblical distinctions between body and soul, between sacred and secular. He says, there was a time when the church was a very powerful thing. In the time the early Christians rejoiced at being deemed worthy to suffer for what they believed in. In those days, the church was not merely a thermometer to record the ideas and principles of popular opinion. It was a thermostat that set the temperature of society. Whenever, whenever, whenever early Christians entered a town, the people saw the power of the church and it immediately disturbed the city. He said, but the Christians today have become silent. He finishes, he says, but the judgment of God is upon the church as it never has been before. If today's church does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it will lose its authenticity. It will forfeit the loyalty of millions and it will be dismissed as an irrelevant social club with no meaning for the 20th, 20th century. He says, every day I meet with young people who have become disappointed because the church is silent. I ask us today, are we silent? I want you to do a little exercise with me for a second. I just want you, for 15 seconds, we're going to say nothing. I want you to hear what that sounds like, okay? Here we go. You know, they shot him 20 times. You know, his body laid in the street for four hours. You know, they put him in that chokehold and they, they heard him say, I can't breathe over and over again. You know that if black children can't read by the third grade, they are building for-profit prisons based on those test scores because they know if we don't have them literate by then, the chances are that they'll end up in prison. But the church is silent. The church is silent. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter, you can go to the next slide. Ephesians chapter 5, our key text today, our focus text today, says this. Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret, but all things become visible when they are exposed by the light. For everything that becomes visible is light. Or in, 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 the, in the proper translation of that, the light exposes everything. Our big idea today when the church, Christians, is silent about sin and ignores the manifested symptoms, or silent, our silence makes us complicit, eroding the integrity of our witness and negatively impacting lives in the temporal and the eternal. When we are silent, when the church sits silent, and has nothing to say about sin and the manifested symptoms in our society. It erodes our witness. It, it, it compromises our integrity and it messes with people's lives in the temporal and the eternal. There are consequences in the now and there are consequences in the later when God's people have nothing to say. 
Turn to your neighbor. Say, neighbor. We're going to shout again in a little bit. <laughs> you know, this is, this, this is one of those things you need to take it in. Shout's coming. Amen. All right. When we are silent, a heavy price is paid. When we are silent and we look the other way, next slide, look what Dr. King says. And we read a little bit of the quote here. He says, the church must be reminded that it is not the master nor the servant of the state, but rather the conscience of the state. I submit to you today that, that the church has gotten confused about its role. You find churches, you find more churches that are, that are aligned with political platforms than they are with kingdom platforms. And, and we wonder why the culture is not shifting because the church has aligned itself with platforms and not the Savior. We, we, we think that to be Republican means to be Christian. We think to be Democrat means to be Christian. And, and that's not the case. He saved some of y'all Republicans so you could be a Christian. He saved some of you Democrats so you could be a Christian. Yeah. Dr. King says the church must be the guide and the critic of the state yeah. and never its tool. If the church does not recapture its prophetic zeal, it will become an irrelevant social club. Without moral, get this, without moral or spiritual authority. Y'all have read it. Y'all have read it in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 says, look, if you want to hide your light under a bushel, if you don't want to be who God wants you to be, then it will become good for nothing but to be walked on, to be trodden on by the feet of men. We wonder why folks have lost respect for the church today. It's because the church has lost respect for God. We, we, we wonder why. When I was growing up, you, you might be cutting up, but you walk past the church. You straighten up. Amen. You, you might be saying some bad language, but if you walk past the preacher, you would stop using that language. But now we got the preacher cussing with the people. Amen. Dr. King said this 55 years ago, ago. He said this quote. He said, look, wake up church. Yeah. See, we, we forget. And, and, and I try to correct, I correct people every time I see it. Everybody wants to say Dr. Martin Luther King. And I always remind them, no, 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 no. It's Reverend Doctor. Amen. Because before he was doing anything doctor related, he was doing stuff reverend related. Amen. And it was the reverend that kept him fighting as he did. Y'all heard it on Wednesday with the presentation. It was that, that still small voice that whispered to him and kept him focused when he wanted to give up. Have we become a social club hmm. has it become just about what we're wearing what we're driving how much money we make has it become even in the church about what fraternity you in and what sorority you in have we become a social club, an exclusive club where only people who look like us can get in? Have we become a social club where, where, where we really don't want outsiders in because we like how we are? Have we become a social club that is not really worried about the outside world? We want to be worried about our comfort on the inside. See, I used to take a group every year to go sing at the Denver Country Club for their Christmas uh, event. And, and when we walked in there, we were the only chips in the cookie. <laughs> Some of y'all know what that means, amen. We were the only chips in the cookies until my wife started coming. Then we had, she kind of made us a macadamia and 
We would only chips in the cookie, and, and when we walked in there, we, we definitely felt like we didn't belong. They treated us like the help. They, 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 they treated us like y'all entertain us, and then y'all get out. I wonder if the church has sadly done that to those who are on the outside looking in. Do do, do people come and and visit our churches and feel like they don't belong? Because they don't have the dress. They don't have the this. They don't have the that. They don't have the... I went out and bought... This is the first time ever I think I preached in a t-shirt amen I was feeling good about myself too amen I went out and bought it and I said you know I was you know you you I was grappling with this stuff I said well, 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 well you know what I'm about to put buy me a t-shirt and go up and preach and I, I bought a theme you're gonna see that's the theme of the message here in just a second amen but I said I wonder how do we treat people who come in in t-shirts. And I don't mean restoration. I, I'm talking about the universal church. How, how do we treat people who, who come in and, 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 and they've, got, they've got dirt on their hands and they've got dirt on their face and, and, and they've, got a, they've got a different kind of cologne smell to them. Amen. How, 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 how are we? How are we? How are we treating folks? Dr. King says, Have you become a social club that you're so worried about everything that's going on the inside that you've forgotten that you are supposed to be impacting what's going on on the outside? You know, those of you, some of you are my friends on social media, and I get into a lot of great debates with folks on social media. One of the things that I never do on social media is I never bash the church, right? But... We in the house today, right? We at home today, amen. And the truth of the matter is that for every condition that we see going on in the world, we are the answer. And we are equally the problem. Yeah, yeah, y'all can, yeah, amen, amen. We are the answer, but we are equally the problem. Politics, and I got some political friends in there. We got Representative James Coleman here, amen, amen. Good friend of mine, amen, but I, I look, I tell him all the time, man, you go to the state house, that's great, but you're a believer, right? And he, and he walks this out, right? Because no matter what you do in politics, there's some things that politics can't fix, amen. No matter who you elect, There are some things that politics cannot move because those are God things. That's why you have a 12-hour prayer, right? That's why you have a 12-hour prayer because there are some things that we have to give to God because only God can move. You know, we hear all these shootings and people say, we need more than, than prayers and thoughts. No, you need prayer, amen. Let's not get it twisted, amen. You need prayer. Because there's some things you can't figure out when mass shootings continue to occur across our country. The mindset of people to to do those things, you can't fix that, but God can. And that's why we pray. That's why we pray. That's why we pray. That's why we pray. He says, look, the reason why, next slide, the reason why you and I are the solution It's because the church, Christians, cannot be silent because we have the call. Amen. Turn to your neighbor. Say, neighbor, we have the call. We have the call. Look back at at that Ephesians text. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2 says, Therefore, be imitators of God. You could preach a sermon just right there. Amen. Therefore, be imitators of God. As beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Amen. How many of you have kids or grandkids, nieces or nephews? Raise your hand. Amen. Amen. Or ever have had a little brother or sister? 
Y'all know what this imitation thing is like. And sometimes it's annoying. You know, you're sitting there and, and, and they're going you know, to do everything you do. You say, you say something, you say, I'm going to my room. They say, I'm going to my room. I'm going to put up. And they're just back and forth. You're like, stop. Right? It gets annoying. And you know, I've been there as a parent. There's some things that your kids imitate and you know it came from you. And then they say that word in public and you're like, oh, girl, where she learned that from? <laughs> Imitating, right? Imitating what she sees, imitating what he hears, amen. So we get this imitation thing down. He says, believers have the call to imitate God. The reason why we cannot be silent is because God is not silent. God speaks. God sees injustice and God speaks. So if we are to imitate God, we cannot be silent because we have the call to imitate God. Some of us don't know that God speaks about justice because we ain't been in... 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. There are some things that you don't know that God has spoken on because you are not reading what he said. So you don't know what to say. You don't know how to speak. You don't, but God has spoken. He's not silent. He's not silent about how government must treat its people. Y'all know where that is. He's not silent about how masters must treat their slaves or or how employers must treat their employees. He's not silent about those things. He's not silent about how husbands should love their wives. He's not silent about how parents should raise their children. He's not silent about those things. And so therefore, we cannot be silent because we are imitating God. Amen. Turn to your neighbor. Say, neighbor, I have the call. To imitate God. Yeah, see, some of y'all, you have headaches in your life because you're imitating the wrong people. Okay, let's be real. You can get your hair done like Beyonce, but you ain't Beyonce. Amen? <laughs> let's be real. Amen? We try to imitate the wrong people. We chase it after the wrong things. Imitate God. We look at these successful people and you say, I want to be like Bill Gates and I want to be this, I want to be like... Now, I need some believers who say, look, I just want to, I want to imitate God, amen? I, I want to imitate God, amen? Uh, wherever I go, I want to imitate God. Where, wherever my feet go, I want to walk like God wants me to walk. Whatever words come out of my mouth, I want to imitate God. Because see, me imitating anybody else doesn't change the situation. Me imitating anybody else does not break strongholds. Me imitating anybody else does not set people free. I want to imitate God. And that's our call. It's not just the call of the preacher. It's not just the call of the leadership of church. It is the call of every Christian to imitate God. I'm going to use a Felix thing here. Say, self, am I imitating God? Yeah. Ask yourself, am I imitating God? Would God act a fool like I've been acting? Right? That's how real it is. Would God act a fool like I've been acting? Would God ignore the people who have a need when I have a surp when he had a, a surplus, right? Would God do that? Does God treat his bride like I treat my bride? Hear that? Somebody say to me, it's tight, but it's right. Amen. <laughs> Second, next slide. The church cannot be silent because we have made the choice. 
Ephesians chapter 5 again, verse 3, 4, and 5. But immorality or impurity or greed must not even be named among you, as it is proper among saints. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse gesturing, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty, that no immorality or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Amen. I think one of the things we forget is that when we come to Jesus Christ, what we are doing is choosing a very different way of life. He does not draw you with loving kindness. You do not choose him to stay in the mess that you're in. See, you've made this choice. You chose him. And since you chose him, there's an expectation that the life that we live now reflects that we've made a choice for him. Let me help you illustrate this. Some of you brothers in here were some players when you was coming up. And I don't mean basketball players. I don't mean football players. I mean players. Amen? You know, player players. You know what I'm talking about. Amen? You had your kit. Amen? You know the kit. Open it up. Got the cologne. Got the certain brush. Got the certain jet. You know what I'm talking about. Players. But then all of a sudden, Katani comes around. Oh. Uh, then all of a sudden, Katani comes around. And this brother who used to be a player, thinking he was all that in a bag of chips, all of a sudden gets broke down. Re Y'all remember last week and he was talking about my socks, amen? <laughs> all of a sudden... This player, amen, thinking he is just a tall, dark, and handsome chocolate brother from the islands, amen. All of a sudden, this player meets somebody that challenges his player ways. All of a sudden, this brother who was doing his own thing and, 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 and smile, flashing that smile at whoever he wanted to, all of a sudden, he found somebody in his life. And he said, I don't want to be a player no more. <laughs> when you run into Jesus, when you meet the king of kings, when you meet the Lord of lords, you ought to be able to say, I don't want to be a player no more. Amen. You understand that you have made a choice. And because you have made a choice, your life has got to look different. Amen. Felix would not be happily married if he kept playing. Amen. Amen. And some of you are miserable in your Christian life because you keep playing. Amen. So, let me say it again. Some of y'all are miserable in your Christian life because you keep playing. The Lord says to you, I need you to make a choice. I need you to determine that the life I've called you to does not look like the life of the culture, amen. We chasing after the very same things of the culture. Oh, I want the American dream. That's a nightmare, amen. Oh, I, I want the house and I, and I want the white picket fence and I, I want the three car garage and I want, I want, I want, I want. You forget those things gotta be paid for, amen. You don't know what stress comes with those things. And the sad thing, we, we end up doing things that we shouldn't be doing just to get them. He says these things should not even be named among you. 
not even named, not even whispered, not even talked about. That's what the text says there. There are just some behaviors that if you are a child of God, there are some things we just won't even talk about. We won't even glorify it with the conversation. He says, you made a choice, so you, you, you need to not be silent because you made a choice. You, you say, look, look, if you, you, you see brothers and if you made a choice to be, a, 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 like I just said with Felix, you made a choice to be a loving husband and, and a loving father, then you need to speak up when you see other folks not doing that. In your family, you need to be able to say, hey, because I've made a choice. Thirdly, the church cannot be silent because we become children. Everybody say, say children. Look at verse 6 of Ephesians chapter 5. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God has come upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them, for you were formerly, say formerly, you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Trying to learn what is the pleasing to the Lord. Amen. He says, you once were afar off. You once formerly were a child of darkness. You once formerly were a child of wrath, but now you are a child of God. Amen. Y'all know the speech y'all got. I give it to my kids every day. Now, when you leave this house, you better remember what your last name is. <laughs> I don't care how Johnny Jackson acts up. Your name is Caleb Jones. I don't care how Mary Jackson acts up. Your name is Lily Jones. You know who your daddy is. And if you go acting up like you are Lily Jackson and come home and think you ain't going to meet Vernon Jones, amen, you got a problem, amen. We cannot continue to say that we are his children and still act like our, uh, our former daddy, amen. We are his children. We are his children, and because we are his children, we cannot be silent because we want to walk in agreement with daddy. Amen. Turn to the neighbor and say, neighbor, I want to walk in agreement with my daddy. Yeah. He says, look, you are my children. And look, that's that shout right there that, that we were once children of darkness. But now you are children of light. There needs to be a clear distinction between who we once were and who we are right now. Light and darkness are very different. One of the things I love about my new office over here, I would say Pastor Kay's office, she's letting me borrow right now. Amen. And uh, you can shut the door, turn out the lights, and it is complete darkness. And you can just meditate, right? The room is totally different when I turn the light on. When I turn the light on, I see all these stacks of papers, all this stuff that Felix has emailed me, and I'm reading and reading and highlighting and reading and all this and all. He keep a brother busy, amen, and, and, and all this. Uh, and, but then I, sometimes I got to turn my light out <laughs> so I don't see all that mess, right? But let me tell you something. It's dangerous for us to turn our lights off. Okay, we figure, you know what, I don't, I, I don't, I don't want, I'm not going to turn this off, I ain't going to hurt this for a little bit, I'm going, no, 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 no. We have a responsibility within the culture to always let our light shine. Even when it's inconvenient, we have to let our light shine because of who our daddy is. We are his children. And just like I expect my children to go out and represent us well wherever they go, God expects us to represent him well wherever we go. Oh, you might have a boss that you can't stand. Everybody's got a boss you can't stand. Raise your hand unless they're sitting next to you. Amen? <laughs> okay. But even in that situation, God is expecting you to reflect him. He's expecting you to remember who you are a child of. And go in that situation and be light. 
See, the church cannot be silent because we have a call, we have a choice, and we are his children. And lastly today, the church cannot be silent because we have the cure. Yeah, I told you shouting was about to come. Amen. Turn and say, neighbor, we have the cure. If I told you today that I discovered the cure for cancer, and I said, I'm going to keep it just in case I or my children get cancer. How would you feel? Here I was possessing the cure for a disease that is ravishing the lives of children at Children's Hospital right now. Here I had in my hand the cure to a disease that has taken some of the people that we love in our life. But I told you I'm going to keep it to myself just in case I get sick or my children get sick. What would you think of me? Not much. How could he do that? Does he not understand the lives that he could save? Does he not understand the pain that he can stop? Does he not understand? Huh. So if I had the cure to cancer and I didn't share it, you wouldn't think much of me. You would think I was a monster. You'd think I was selfish. Huh. What if we have the cure and we are being selfish and silent what if we have the cure to not just temporal pain but what if we have the cure to eternal pain and we refuse to speak up what if we continue to use excuses well they won't let me talk about that on my job well you ain't always on your job Oh, well, they won't let me pray here. Well, they won't let me do this. They won't let me do that. We, we continue to make excuses why we won't share the cure, and people continue to die every day without knowing the truth about Jesus Christ. But you and I have the cure. You and I, as Dr. King would say, have the balm of Gilead. You and I have the cure. And we have to share the cure with the world. Turn to say, say, neighbor, I have the call. I have the choice. I am his child and I have the cure. When we look at what will fix our world today, it's not a political solution. It's not a financial solution. It's not education even. But what will fix our solution is if the church stops being silent. If you as a believer stop being silent and choose to open up your mouth and tell them, I've been called. I've made a choice. I am his child, and I have the cure. When you, when you, when you see somebody hurting and you can say to them, I, I, I have the cure because I once was hurting, and he healed me. You, you can say, I, I once was, was, was lost, but, but he found me. I, I, I once was broken, but he healed me. I, I once was struggling and he set me free. I have the cure. For young men and women contemplating suicide who, who think that, that everything's over and that there is no hope, we say we have the cure. For young men and young women caught up in gang activity because they can't find love anywhere else, the church stands up and says, we have the cure. For broken homes, children without fathers, 
we boldly stand up in this time and say, we have the cure. The exciting thing about a cure is you know that it works because it worked on you. Amen. Yeah. See, I'm not giving anything that I haven't tried myself. Amen. I know he's the cure because in my brokenness, he healed my heart. In my depression, he gave me new joy. In my waywardness, he ordered my steps. I know he's the cure because he walks with me. I know he's the cure because he talks with me. I, I know he's the cure because every now and then grandmama says he whispers in my ear and reminds me that I am his child. He is the cure. And the only ones who can give it to the world is his church. We cannot be silent. Father, we thank you for the word today. We thank you, God, that we cannot be silent. For such a time as this, we, your sons and daughters, declare that we hear our call, that we've made our choice, that we recognize that we are your children and that you are the cure. So God, let us be a city on a hill. Let us be the salt of the earth. Let us be light in darkness, that this world might be transformed and changed because the church decided not to be silent. God, there may be someone in this house today, God, who, who does not know you and the Holy Spirit is drawing them today with loving kindness. And God, today we want you to move on their hearts before it's everlasting too late, God, that they would hear today that you love them, that you care about them. And today you want them to begin a new start with you. Today we are not silent, but we say that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We thank you for your word today, God. We thank you for how it draws. In Jesus' name, amen.